to begin with an obvious but surprisingly difficult question. What are comics? That's uh, one definition from Scott McCloud. It's a controversial one. Uh, you'll notice, amongst other things, um, that describing uh, needing a series of images means that gag cartoons would get left out. Um, so there's a surprising amount of argument even about what comics are formally. Um, when they began is also an issue. Some claim that comics are essentially an American invention emerging for the first time in the 1890s when strips like Richard Outcall's The Yellow Kid played a central role in Joseph Pulitzer and William Randolph Hearst's battle for superiority in the newspaper circulation wars. Um, but others claim that the use of pictures in sequence to tell a story predates the foundation of the United States by several thousand years. For these critics, elements of comic art can be found in cave paintings. And, uh, and I'll, if anyone wants to know what the element of comic art is there, um, I'm happy to talk to you about it later, but I'll point out the eight legs on that bison um, are a clue. Cave paintings, or perhaps even uh, early hieroglyphic alphabets, offered as early examples of comic art. Of course, these ancient practices may seem rather remote from modern comics to most of you, particularly if your definition of the form requires a page or more of images in sequence, reading from top to bottom with speech balloons for dialogue. To find all those things, well, you'll have to leap forward to the 12th century um, in Europe for manuscripts like this one. This is a page from St. Stephen's Bible depicting the story of David and Goliath. I particularly like the close-up here of Goliath's size conveyed as he bursts out of the panel, a technique that would be uh, anticipate superhero comics by about 800 years. Now, admittedly, it could be argued that this isn't really a comic in the modern sense either, perhaps on the grounds of the elevated content and the fact that it was obviously created for a small elite audience. But what about an example like this? A broadside from 17th century England, Francis Barlow's A True Narrative of the Popish Plot. The Popish Plot, it was an attempt to stir up ill will on the part of English Protestants towards Catholics through defamatory rumors and falsehoods. In political terms, you might think of this broadside as the 17th century equivalent of, let's say, a homemade anti-Muslim video on YouTube. Um, but I, what I want you to notice is that all the conventions of the modern comic form appear to have been established with this ignominious piece of prejudicially motivated popular culture. We have a narrative sequence of images reading left to right and top to bottom, complete with word balloons and panel borders. What's more, this is a printed document, mass-produced, relatively inexpensive, and the content, as you can see from the flagellation scene in the middle here, um, anything but elevated. Um, it wouldn't be a British comic if somebody didn't get hit on the butt at some point. <clears throat> um, instead, it appeals to the prurient instincts of the reader with its mixture of religious hatred and gossipy scandal-mongering. In my opinion, you need a very good reason not to call this a 17th century comic. Now, so in other words, contrary to what you may have heard, comics are not an American invention, but it is accurate to describe the superhero comic as a uniquely American contribution to world culture. And as global exports go, it's a very successful one. This cover, by the way, appeared about six months before Pearl Harbor. Um, so where do American superheroes come from? The winning formula of the superhero comic book derives from the combination of two basic forms of popular entertainment that rose to prominence in the early 20th century in the USA. The serialized newspaper comic strip and the pulp magazine. It's the great Frank R. Paul, the illustrator of that cover. Now, to begin with the American newspaper strip, as I already mentioned, this art form really gets going in the 1890s when newspapers discovered that cartoonists could make a significant contribution to sales. The tone of early newspaper comics is essentially comedic, whether absurdist and slapstick, based on racial and ethnic stereotypes. That's Happy Hooligan, a popular Irish comic character of the 1890s. Um, or on the supposedly humorous violation of gender and class norms. This is why people refer to these strip cartoons as the funnies or the comics. However, that name would start to seem increasingly inaccurate during the 1920s when these so-called comics began to register the impact of another popular art form of the day, the pulps. Named after the cheap, coarse wood pulp paper on which they were printed, the pulps notoriously offered sensationalist, action-filled fantasy and adventure stories in almost every genre. Western pulps, war pulps, science fiction pulps, jungle pulps, crime pulps, horror pulps, 
just plain weird shit popes. <laughs> the plots of these stories were crowded with thugs, underdressed malls, and he-men, and the covers, as you can see, were vivid to the point of being lurid. Um, now, in the 1920s and 30s, these magazines were enormously popular, particularly with teenage boys, um, although most parents and teachers dismissed them as trash. A lot of pulp writing was weak, hackneyed, and exploitative, but actually the list of great American writers um, who published in the pulps is very impressive, and it includes such luminaries as, and this is in alphabetical order by last name, Isaac Asimov, Ray Bradbury, Robert Bloch, Raymond Chandler, Philip K. Dick, Earl Stanley Gardner, Dashiell Hammett, Frank Herbert, Robert E. Howard, Jack London, H.P. Lovecraft, Horace McCoy, Upton Sinclair, and Tennessee Williams. Perhaps more well-known than any of these authors, however, are the most successful creations of the pulp era. Buck Rogers, Conan the Barbarian. That's actually the very first cover appearance of Conan the Barbarian, um, painted by a pulp illustrator named Margaret Brundage. Not the uh, Conan that we have come to know, but that's his first appearance. Um, let's see, Doc Savage, the Man of Bronze, Tarzan of the Apes, The Shadow, and Zorro. These characters would eventually become familiar to audiences everywhere, appearing in almost every entertainment medium throughout the last century. Now, when the pulps and the comics first combined, it was in the form of fairly literal adaptations. Uh, Tarzan of the Apes comic, for example, that debuted in 1929. This was one of the most successful early uh, adventure comic strips, largely due to the extraordinary draftsmanship of the artist Hal Foster. Hal Foster was one of a new breed of comics artists who owed less to the tradition of cartooning, with its penchant for distortion and abstraction, and more uh, to the more um, technically accomplished, conventionally representational world of magazine illustration. You can see this most clearly in Foster's magnum opus, Prince Valiant, which he drew every week with astonishing consistency and attention to detail from 1937 to 1970. It only ever ap appeared as a Sunday page. He spent over 60 hours a week working on one page. Um, Alex Freeman, oh, here's another piece of, that's some of his original art, so you can see again um, uh, his uh, brushwork and penmanship. Now, Alex Raymond, one of Foster's very few rivals, was also one of the first comic creators to invent a new character out of pulp conventions, and that's the spacefaring Flash Gordon that you can see here. Noted in its early days for Raymond's fine dry brush inking style, this is all brushwork. This is, you know, obviously long before the days of computer illustration. Um, uh, Alex Raymond all doing all this with ink and brush. Uh, Flash Gordon was also one of the first newspaper adventure heroes to cross over from comics into other media, inspiring a famous movie serial in 1936. Um, now, as this example shows, Raymond's work was more overtly sexual than Hal Foster's. He was far more inclined to draw women in provocative clothing and poses. And again, here's another flagellation scene. You may be seeing a theme developing here. Um, from an early Flash Gordon strip in which Flash's girl, uh, girlfriend, Dale Arden, is being whipped by another woman in a space helmet and bikini. Um, <laughs> A scene that is clearly intended to invoke the kinky thrills of sadomasochism, whatever thin justification might have been provided by the plot. Alex Raymond's influence, if not his level of mastery, can be seen in this strip, illustrated by Ray Moore and written by Lee Falk, and starring another of the new breed of adventurers. This character was named the Phantom, and he fought evildoers while wearing a strange skin-tight costume and domino mask. Now, he lacked any special powers. The phantom role, it turns out, is an inheritance passed down from father to son for 20 generations. Wouldn't you have loved to have been there for that bedside conversation? Here you are, son, the skin-tight costume. Sorry, it's <laughs> didn't have time to clean it. Um, and um, his civilian identity was also somewhat underdeveloped. In fact, newspaper readers never saw this, the character's face clearly without the mask. Nevertheless, Debuting as it did in 1936, the Phantom is generally agreed to be the first costumed superhero to see print. So at this point then, the stage is set for the full-blown emergence of the superhero genre, but one more element was required, and that was the development of the comic book itself. Uh, let's see. Now, in the 1930s, the comic book was an upstart medium. This is the first nationally distributed comic book in the United States, Famous Funnies number 1 from 1934, and it contained no original material. It was all reprinted newspaper strips. Um, there were a handful of these, 
Um, and uh, they didn't make a lot of money. We're talking about a very sort of poor relation to the newspaper strip. But um, this would change in 1938 when a small and vaguely mob-connected pulp publishing company called Independent News bought a character named Superman from two young men from Cleveland for a new anthology title, Action Comics. So this, by the way, is now the most collectible comic of all time. Um, three copies sold for over a million dollars a piece over the last 18 months. So if you want to know what the 1% were reading last year. Um, um, by the way, um, Independent News p acquired total rights to this character from Jerry Siegel and Joshua to the creators um, with the initial purchase of $130. Um, neither Superman's creators nor the publisher were hugely enthusiastic about one another at first. Writer Jerry Siegel and artist Joe Schuster were disappointed not to have sold their creation as a newspaper strip, while publisher Harry Donenfeld reportedly accused his editors of making a huge mistake when he first saw a copy of Action Comics No. 1. He was unable to imagine that anyone would take the concept seriously. Donenfeld insisted that the ridiculous Superman character be taken off the cover. That's the cover of Action Comics No. 2 which is, as you can see, much more conventionally pulpy material. And when the comic started to sell better than expected, nobody at the company could believe that Siegel and Schuster's creation was the reason. But it was. As Donenfeld eventually learned, children were asking not for action comics, but for the comic with Superman in it. And within six months, they had the sales figures back, and they knew it was outselling every other comic book on the market. So they put Superman back on the cover with number seven, <coughs> with sales of about a million copies per month. A million copies per month for a genre, that, for a whole comic book form didn't even really exist prior to this. Within a year, Superman had his own regular title, the first successful comic book to actually be named after an original comic character, and that sold even better. Within 18 months, dozens of imitators and rivals who inspired their own imitators and rivals were appearing in magazines of their own all within about 18 months of the first appearance of Superman. In one mighty bound then, Superman had jump-started the entire comic book industry, and costumed superheroes have remained the dominant genre within that industry to the present day. So that's a very quick history of the origins of superhero comics. And I'd like to conclude by pointing out that the success of the modern superhero raises some interesting questions about the cross-cultural fascination exerted by heroic myths. It's long been a source of interest, not just to people in my field, but anthropologists, psychologists, as well as literary scholars, that certain symbols and stories appear to recur again and again across distinct societies and time periods, even in cases where there's no evidence of direct historical influence. Carl Jung considered the myth of the hero to be one such recurring story. And he was one of the first modern thinkers to identify the following elements in common across many different heroic myths. I'll give you a moment here to just sort of take in the repeated elements. Now, some examples of heroic tales that share all of these basic structural elements um, include the story of Gilgamesh, Hercules, uh, let's see, what do we got here, Oedipus, Romulus, and Moses, that was the most superhero-y image of Moses that I could find for you. Um, but it should be quickly apparent that the origin of more modern pulp heroes, such as Tarzan, conform to this basic structure, as does that of Superman, the archetypal superhero. Now, why should this be? For psychoanalysts such as Otto Rank, the heroic myth is important because it counteracts our childhood feelings of powerlessness within the family in a classic act of projection and wish fulfillment. Um, my hostility towards daddy becomes daddy's hostility towards me, so on and so forth. In short, heroic myths reconfigure our unconscious infantile struggles in story form. Now, whether you buy that or not, and I'm not asking you to, the key point to be grasped is that for thinkers like Jung, Rank, Joseph Campbell, and many, many others, we are drawn to stories about heroes simply by virtue of being human. Indeed, our fascination with heroic archetypes may be as fundamental to our makeup as our language capacity. Again, I stress I don't ask you to believe this without a bit more evidence, uh, certainly more than I could provide in 15 minutes. The issue is one of considerable complexity with wide-ranging implications. But one of these implications is that the violent, vulgar, melodramatic, and yes, distinctly American genre of superhero comics 
may actually tell us something about our essential human nature. And it was with that provocative suggestion that I must end this all too brief presentation. Thank you for your time and attention.